ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله يا ايها الذين امنوا تقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس تقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا تقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم وما يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد الحمد لله والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله yesterday at the university of calgary as many of us would have seen the videos in emulation of what is happening in other universities throughout Canada and the United States, starting with Columbia University and then thereafter spreading like wildfire. There were many people that set up encampments at the University of Calgary demanding that they divest from the so-called state of Israel. In this particular incident that we see, we find that when those individuals set up camp at the University of Calgary, they were met with fierce resistance last night at 11 p.m. The Calgary Police Service came in with tear gas, with batons, with shields, with uh, even including flashbang grenades and uh, rubber bellets and uh, paintballs, trying to disperse and eventually did so those protesters that were there in that particular area. Now, there are a number of things that a person could look at this scenario of what has taken place and derive certain lessons therein. The first point that we understand is that it has been a long time coming because as a community it has been seven months of this ongoing genocide and in these seven months muslims and non-muslims who are against this particular uh, regime and what they are doing they exhausted every single legal means every single attempt at trying to get them to stop going to the icj trying to put resolutions against that particular country and nothing has happened thus far so it only becomes natural thereafter that a step further as which happened in 1985 in Columbia University when the uh, apartheid South Africa it is only natural that something like that would thereafter follow we see in this particular incident when all of these things took place there were certain people that were also wrestled to the ground people that were arrested and fined and uh, all of these incidents when they take place it reminds us of something important which we find to be the case whenever we actually want change to take place and that is the fact that if you actually want change to take place there are going to have to be certain sacrifices made and what is meant by this is that Allah SWT says in the Quran in Surah Ali Imran wa udu fi sabili you are going to be have to certain people would have to be harmed in the path of Allah in order for change to actually take place. This happened in the civil rights movement, this happened at the end of apartheid South Africa, and we see this also happening in today's society and place as we are seeing at the University of Calgary on our very shores in our very city today here as well. When you look at those Sahaba radiallahu anhu majma'een, we find something really interesting about them. The first point is that when you look at the total number of Sahaba that there were, they were between 114,000 and 124,000 Sahaba. 100,000 witnessed the Prophet sallallahu at his farewell sermon, sermon in the khutbah al wada'a. But with this number in terms of those whose names we actually know, how many are they? According to uh, Ibn Abdul Bar in his book Al Isti'ab fi Ma'rifat al Ashab, there are around 3,000 names alone that we know. And from these 3,000, in terms of those stories that we actually know, those that were the actual difference makers of the Ummah, they are very few. Perhaps 300, perhaps to 1,000 at its absolute maximum. We know something about these particular individuals and what took place within their lives. And when it comes to those whom we actually know, if we were to ask ourselves this right now, this is an unfortunate question. An unfortunate question is that we don't know many of the Sahaba. We could perhaps list 10, 20 at the absolute maximum. The best from among us could probably list 50 and what they particularly did. But when it comes to those names that were recorded, there's a reason for this. 
There's a reason for this. It is mentioned by Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, who was one of the first Muslims, the sixth Muslim to enter Islam. And he was one that entered Islam as a young kid as well. And this goes to show that when we see these protests happening, they are not happening at workplaces. They are not happening at libraries. They are not even happening in the masajid, but they are happening in the universities. And that is by design. When we see that this is happening, we find that when you're able to galvanize the youth, that is when you will truly see societal change. This happened in history and this will repeat itself once more. Abdullah Mas'ud was among the first to publicize his Islam. For those that are practicing silently, it is one level. But those who publicize their Islam, this becomes another level. But he mentions prior to himself, he was the first to recite Quran in public. Prior to himself, there were other individuals that preceded him. And he mentions in a hadith where he says, that كَانَ أَوَّلَ مَا from those that first publicized their Islam, there were seven of them. The first of them, leading by example, was an Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was protected by Abu Talib. The second from among these was Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu an, and he was protected by his tribe, uh, Banu Tayyim bin Murrah. The remaining five, without exception, all of these individuals, they were tortured, and they were uh, severely tortured, some of them. But we see that those individuals that were at this level, as Allah SWT mentions in the Quran, وَفَضَّلَ اللَّهُ الْمُجَاهِدِينَ عَلَى الْقَاعِدِينَ أَجْرٌ عَظِيمًا Those that are sitting down, those that are still at home, they don't have the same degree of reward as those that are active and doing things for the sake of change in this particular way. There might have been some people that they thought about going to the protest, but they thought maybe what happens if I get arrested, and they didn't go. But there were some individuals that still went despite this. And then you have another category. From among the five individuals that remained here, we say that there were seven that first publicized their Islam, and five of them they were tortured. These five have a high rank with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who were these individuals? We have from among them Ammar ibn Yasir radiallahu anhu. We have his mother Sumayya radiallahu anha. We have from among them Al-Niqdad radiallahu an, we have Suhaiba Rumi radiallahu an, and we have Bilal ibn Rabah radiallahu an. From among these, these five individuals, they have a high rank with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To the point that the family of Ammar ibn Yasir, when his father Yasir and his brother as well were killed by the mushrikeen, and his mother also Sumayya radiallahu anha, we all know her story. When she was killed, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he told the family, he said, Sabran al Yasir fa inna mawaidukum al jannah. Be patient, family of Yasir. Eventually, your destination will be Jannah. Those individuals, they publicized their Islam and they found no problem with this. But from among this group, there is still one individual that was distinct among the rest. And that is a name that every single Muslim, every single Muslim child knows this particular name. When we mention this name, there is one name that stands out. And who is this person? This is Bilal ibn Rabah. And the point being here is that the remaining five of them, when the mushrikeen tortured them to a certain point, eventually they gave them what they wanted. But Bilal Murabah radiallahu an, he continuously and persisted in saying, Ahadun Ahad, even when a boulder was brought and placed on his chest, as we know by Umay ibn Khalaf. And this particular idea or concept is known by every single Muslim. What we see from this is the protests which took place, there were people that went out. This was level one, those individuals that went out. But then there were those people that when the police told them that it's over, go home, or you're going to be arrested. There were some people that still stayed behind despite the threat of arrest and despite the threat of fines and despite the threat of sanctions and despite the threat of being thrown out of the university and despite the threat of perhaps losing future job opportunities. Those individuals are those that are remembered like Bilal and Rabah radiallahu an. Those are the ones that when they take the sacrifice, they will be the true difference makers and change makers of this ummah. As we saw in, South, in, in apartheid South Africa when it ended, a similar situation unfolded in Columbia University. History eventually will show that this side is the correct side. But there are some people that might be uh, somewhat hesitant because of these particular reasons as we have mentioned. But you need to ask yourself, to what degree are you willing to put yourself on the front line for the sake of defending the Ummah of Islam. When it comes to this as well, there are many things we can do as believers, even those that are not there. For those individuals that might have been fined by going to this protest, why is it not that this community cannot raise funds and pay off their fine? For those individuals that have been sanctioned from getting a job in the future, why do we not have a strong enough community that those individuals to get a job from a Muslim businessman or woman was able to give them that particular job and consider the fact 
fact that they went to this protest as an honor rather than something against the record. And these are things that we can do. We find that when it comes to the Mu'addins of Islam, we mentioned this two weeks ago. Bilal ibn Rabah an, is not the only one among them. Another one of them, his name was Sa'ad ibn Aid al Qarad. And this individual Sa'ad, it is mentioned of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa what did he say about him? He said to him, If you don't see Bilal with you, you be the Adhan. You, you be the Mu'addin. And this goes to show that if certain people are arrested, there are other people in the Ummah who are still there that can still hold the banner and flag of La ilaha illallah and ensure that justice is eventually achieved. We see that when it comes to these uh, particular uh, uh, protests, those individuals that are involved in this, as we have mentioned, they are of a particular age group. Generation Z, these are the youth that are involved in the protests, and this is by design, this is not by coincidence. And when we look at the Prophet and what he did among the Sahaba, among the youth, among the Sahaba, then this becomes a model for us to follow. Some examples that we can allude to in relation to the life of the Prophet we find that when Zayd ibn Harith, the adopted son of the Nabi وسلم, gave his life in the battle of Mu'ta, as we know in the famous example, when the Prophet وسلم, he told Zayd that you be the leader, if you are to follow the flag bearer, you, you are to follow as the leader and the flag bearer, it should go to Abdullah ibn Rawaha. And then when he falls, it should go to Ja'far. This all happened. And when he passed away, the Prophet وسلم, made his son Usama bin Zayd thereafter the next commander. He identified this trait within him. The Prophet وسلم, and another example, the example of Zayd ibn Thabit radiallahu anhu. Zayd ibn Thabit radiallahu anhu as a young kid wanted to be one that was active, part and parcel of activism. And he wanted to partake and participate in the battle of Badr. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he told him, you are too young right now. Zayd ibn Thabit radiallahu anhu, he started to cry. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he identified a trait and a talent that this kid had. And he told uh, Zayd ibn Thabit, he said, in the meantime, do something useful. Go and learn the Syriac language, go and learn the Hebrew language, learn how to become a scribe. Eventually he did so. And he was among those that wrote down the Quran and the revelation of the Quran when it was revealed. To the point that when the Prophet ﷺ passed away, and there was a battle which took place called the Battle of Yamama in which many of the Huffad lost their lives. And in the era of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq they ordered the Jam'ah of the Qur'an, the first compilation of the, of, the, of, the, of the Mus'haf and the Qur'an, so as to make sure and ensure that future generations would not be deprived of this. The prime scribe responsible for this, in terms of its collection, the one that was tasked with this was none other than Zayd ibn Thabit And these are things that we need to do as a community to make great changes change in terms of the future. Make certain sacrifices for yourself and you'll find that you're going to be remembered most importantly by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And secondly, this is when true change will actually come. This is when true change will actually come. We also find the importance of nurturing the next generation if you want this change to happen. These protests are happening at the universities, not at the masajid. The final point we'll mention in today's khutbah is an incredible hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this hadith is in fact one of the predictions of Yawm Al-Qiyamah and we have seen it uh, come to realization within our lifetime. And this hadith gives us indication of what we should think in relation to what is happening around the world. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in this hadith, which is narrated in Al-Mu'jim Al-Kabir of Al-Tabarani, he mentions regarding this Ummah, and he says with respect to this Ummah, this hadith is hadith from Sahih, it's an authentic narration. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, that the first part of this matter of Islam will be prophethood and mercy. This was the era of the Prophet وسلم, those blessed 23 years. Thereafter he says, After this it will be the era of the Khulafa al-Rashidun, those uh, rightly guided, guided leaders of Islam, and there will also be mercy therein. Thereafter the Prophet وسلم, he says, after this point, it will be kingdoms and mercy. We find Dawlatul Umawiya, Dawlatul Abbasiya, Dawlatul Uthmaniya, these particular uh, caliphates of Islam. We find in this region or time frame, it was kingdom, meaning a father would pass on leadership to his son. And there were some bad, but at the same time, the hadith very clearly tells us, Thereafter, what is the next stage? after that stage will be certain emirates, meaning that the, 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 the nation and the 
uh, Ummah of Islam will be fragmented into smaller pieces. And in fact, this happened even earlier on. In the uh, Umayyad era, when the Abbasids took over from them, the Umayyads, they went to Andalus, they went to Spain, and they set up camp over there. There was some fragmentation of the Ummah, even within this time frame, but nonetheless, the Hadith very clearly tells us, ثُمَّ يَكُونُ إِمَارَةً وَرَحْمَةً Thereafter, what does the Hadith say? The hadith says, ثُمَّ يَتَكَادَمُونُ عَلَيْهِ تَكَادُمُ الْحُمُرُ After this point, people will fight over the, the, the Ummah of Islam and the nations and the countries of Islam just as donkeys fighting over food. And this is in reference to the colonial period wherein the Italians went into Libya and the French, they went into Algeria and the Dutch, they went into East uh, Asia and the uh, Spanish, they went into uh, the Philippines. And we can go on and on and on. The British, they went into the Indian subcontinent. This particular frame is referred to When this happens, what is the result or what should the Ummah do? The Prophet ﷺ, says what? He says, Alaykum bil jihad. We are going to have to fight back against all of this. And he mentions, for example, an example of this is in uh, Libya. When the uh, Italians were attacking there, there was the lion of the desert. Those people that I might have seen or know, heard about his story, Umar Mukhtar an, was fighting on behalf of the Muslims against the Italians in Libya. And this is being referred to here. Thumma ali, uh, uh, when this happens, then Alaykum bil jihad. Thereafter, what does the Prophet say in his hadith? He says, the best type of jihad. He says, وَخَيْرُ جِهَادِكُمْ الْرِبَاطِ The best type of jihad is a type of jihad called al-ribat. What is al-ribat? This concept is mentioned in the Quran in the last ayah of Surah Ali Imran, where Allah SWT says, يَا إِوَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِسْبِرُوا وَصَابِرُوا وَرَابِطُوا O you who believe, have patience and be from those that guards and safeguards and garrisons the frontiers of Islam. al ribat essentially is referring to the fact that when you have a, 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 a Muslim uh, area or Muslims in general, and those people that are at the front lines of defending the Muslims against those that want to attack them, this quality is called al ribat And it is so beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that it is mentioned in the hadith, one night and one day of al ribat is greater than an entire month of fasting and an entire month of qiyam. One day and one night of al ribat is better than the entire month of Ramadan which just passed us. Imagine the great reward found in this particular concept of al ribat and garrisoning and protecting the fortress of, of Islam. Another hadith, by the way, it also mentions that there are three eyes that will not taste the fire of Jahannam. They will not be burned. One of them is that eye that lowered itself for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second eye is that eye that shed a tear for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the third eye is that eye that engaged in al ribat and, and was making sure and watching whether the enemies would attack the Muslims or not. We find that those individuals that barricaded themselves in the universities, this is a type of ribat that they were doing as well. But the miracle in the hadith is the very last clause or section of this hadith. The Prophet he says, وَخَيْرُ ribatikum asqalan." The best ribat, the best type of garrisoning and protecting yourself is the ribat of Asqalan. Where is Asqalan? It is the city of Ashkelon, just north of Gaza. And this is a miracle hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, which tells us what is happening right now. And we need to ask ourselves, what are we going to be able to do to ensure the this eventually will become and come to an end as it did with apartheid South Africa. We find that in order for this to happen, there are going to have to be people that make those sacrifices, like the university students. But they also require the, our support as a community, as a whole, to ensure that we support them in their endeavor. And this is the right thing to do. And we are taking every single legal means possible. This is true. But at a certain point, when people don't listen, when people don't listen, then as what happened in Columbia University, which eventually actually caused the ending of apartheid South Africa, this is eventually going to be the next step. And this also goes to show that this is a good sign of, inshallah, things coming to an end for the oppression of our Muslim brothers and sisters in Rafah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant them ease in Gaza. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us also agents of that change and help as well. Whatever it is that we can do uh, in this way, making dua, going for this protest, ensuring and ensuring and we make these demands for divestment uh, against these universities that they stop all types of relations with apartheid pariah states and inshallah this will cause a major shift in the ummah
Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Nadi Al-Sura Nabi Hubri Salat, Wa Eidu Hubil Mu'ajizat, Rabbul Arb, Rabbul Samawat, Ahmaduhu Abdahu Hamdin, Wa Akmaluhu Wa Askahu, Wa Ashmaluhu Wa Shiru, La Ilah Nullah, Al-Wahid Wa Afar, Wa Shiru Anna Muhammadin Abduhu Wa Rasuluhu, Al-Mustafa Al-Mukhtar, Sallallahu Sallam Alayhi, Wa Zaduhu Fadlun Sharfu Nadayhi. Ya Ayuhu Ladina Amanu, Uusikum Awwalim Itaqwa Allah, Fakad Fazil Muntaqun, Inna Allah Malaihi Tusaluna Ala Nabi, Ya Ayuhu Ladina Amanu, Sallu Alayhi Wa Sallim Tasleema, Allahumma Salli Ala Muhammad, Wa Ala Ala Muhammad, كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حمد وجيد وبارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حمد وجيد اللهم أصلح أحوال المسلمين اللهم أصلح أحوال المسلمين اللهم أغفر المسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منهم والأموات إنك سميع قريب مجيب الدعوات اللهم أعز الإسلام والمسلمين ودمر أعداءك أعداء الدين اللهم انصر المسلمين المستضعفين في غزة اللهم انصر المسلمين المجاهدين في غزة اللهم وحد سفوف المسلمين اللهم ارزقنا صلاة في مسجد الأقصى وهو حر عزيز اللهم إنا نسألك فتحا مبينا اللهم إنا نسألك نصرا قريبا إن الله يأمر بالعلم الإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعدكم لعلكم تذكرون أذكر الله لي مذكركم واشكره على نعمه زدكم لذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعنا بالصلاة